or are there men in black? Very provocative subject. A lot of opinions for and against been passed by the subject. And some people have had some very nasty experiences with these gentlemen in black. And we look forward very much to hearing what our speaker tonight has to say about them. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present to Norman Oliver. Thank you very much, Arthur. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now, you know, I seem to be up here so often these days in one capacity or another that I really couldn't blame anyone for thinking I was doing rather too much of the talking. Especially since, as you'll see from your cards, that I appear to be hogging two meetings completely. So, firstly, I'd like to explain how this came about. Now, I put myself down to speak for Cosmos on March the 21st, having just completed the Cosmos program, when John Terry Baker sent his Bufora program through to me, saying that he left the February date open for a talk by me. And as I had to get the details off to the printer straight away, I had the alternative either of leaving tonight's date blank or of giving two talks, one to Cosmos and one to Bufora. Well, I chose the latter course, which explains why you have to sit and suffer both in February and in March. You know, I've given a variety of talks on UFOs to a variety of associations and societies. From church, from youth clubs and young conservative associations, to astronomical associations, via such noble institutions as the Totteridge Women's Institute, where being the only male present, I was somewhat unnerved and certainly unvoiced by being, being expected to sing Jerusalem before I began. Through then to the South of the Thames Jewish Society, where before the light dawned, I was somewhat bemused at first by everyone, everybody wishing each other a happy new year when it was only just October. However, it's one thing to give a talk to people, most of whom haven't the slightest knowledge of the subject, and quite another to speak to those who are already well versed in sort of law. And even if they don't know all the answers, at least they know all the awkward questions. First of all, let me make it quite clear that whilst I posed the title of my talk, the question as to whether there are men in black, I do not, to my knowledge, number any of these the gentry amongst my acquaintances. Neither am I one myself, and I sincerely hope that none have managed to creep in here tonight. In fact, quite frankly, I do not know the answer to my own question. So before someone asks me then why the devil I'm speaking about them, I'll tell you what I propose to do. This is to give you quite a few facts on various alleged men in black cases from different parts of the world, to discuss various lines of thought on the subject, and then leave you to accept or reject any of these as you see fit. Now, at this stage, it occurs to me that whilst most of you here know something about men in black activities, there may well be others who are comparatively new to the subject and are wondering what the heck that bloke up there is lettering about. We can hear, hoping to hear something about flying saucers. Well, very briefly, men in black came into prominence quite a few years ago now, when a chap named Al Bender was persuaded to give up his UFO researching activities following visits by three of these gentry. Since then, quite a few UFO researchers, people who've had UFO sightings and contactees, are alleged to have been so approached in one way or another and subsequently silenced by intimidation of some description. I believe in some cases this may well have occurred. I'm certainly not saying it hasn't. But one thing I would ask you to bear in mind, and that is that most people love a mystery. I do myself. And if I may be forgiven the paraphrase, may have made a mystery out of a molehill. I said in some case. However, to come to example, there is really so much material that it's a hard job to know where to begin. But I think that some of the reports and articles in Sorter News from the States, articles by John Keel, Craig Barker and James Mosley, are, are as good a place as any. 
Now, in the editorial of Salter News of autumn 1967, James Mosley wrote, Information reaching us during the past few months from several reliable sources indicates that leading researchers, as well as ordinary saucer cited throughout the country, the country of course being the USA, are being subjected to an unbelievably complex and extensive series of frightening events. Amongst them, attempted as well as successful hush-up by mysterious strangers usually dressed in dark clothing, weird or threatening phone calls and letters, and so on. The appearance of cars with meaningless license plates, or no plates at all, which have followed certain UFO investigators from the source of their work, and other events which are so utterly fantastic that we hesitate to put them into print. Please don't think that we've lost our equilibrium or are merely trying to jazz up the UFO investigation. We are merely reporting the evidence which we've uncovered. It is difficult to pinpoint just where and where, when and where these events begin. Our first attempt to bring the truth to our readers regarding this new phase of the mystery was on a summer issue where we reported that the US Air Force admits to having checked out a number of cases in which mysterious impostors bearing impressive but completely phony official credentials have visited and frightened saucer fighters in various parts of the United States. This following report, which was from John Keel, was later substantiated by an official Air Force letter dated March 1st, 1967. And his editorial says that this letter intended for distribution to all commands is signed by an assistant deputy chief of staff of the Air Force. I can't help feeling that an assistant deputy chief of staff is some one rather low down and not high up itself. Uh, Moses' editorial continues, at a recent UFO convention in New York, several delegates claimed to have been watched and followed while walking on the lower level to the Hotel Commodore by individuals who looked and acted like official military or civilian investigators. But who, as we later learned by checking with the manager, had no connection with the hotel. These men were apparently working out at a room near the hotel's coffee shop to which there is access from a low-level hall and from the nearby Grand Central Station. There is even reason to suppose that they had wiretapping equipment set up temporarily in the room, though by the time anyone thought to check this out, it was too late, the convention was over, and the men, whoever they were, had departed. Well, so much for the excerpt from James Moses' editorial. In the same issue of Salt and News, there were a variety of men in black reports quoted, and again, I'm not saying I believe or I disbelieve any particular one. Though I will say that I don't think it is by any means inconceivable that one or two of them have been jazzed up a bit. Anyway, here are some of them a year still being 1967. On August the 4th, a black Cadillac made a, a deliberate attempt to run over a UFO witness on the main street of a Long Island town. Again on Long Island, two men in Air Force uniforms harassed UFO witnesses. One of these men identified himself as a Lieutenant Frank Davis and threatened, and threatened two different people with a revolver, warning them to watch out who you talk to. Colonel John Dalton interviewed at least three Long Island residents and asked them to fill out complicated forms which contained involved questions about the witness's personal history. Through officials on Long Island, John Keel had a check run on both these men. The Air Force denied that it knew anything about either one or that men with those names were assigned anywhere on the island. Lieutenant Frank Davis later turned up in a postman's uniform and was followed by Keel. Davis and another man were engaged in taking photographs of the homes of UFO sighters. While involved in this investigation, Keel had two encounters with a large black Cadillac in an isolated section of Long Island. In one of these encounters, the Cadillac, which contained two dark-skinned men, was parked and laying in wait on a deserted road. In the other incident, Keel did a turnabout and followed the Cadillac for several miles. Also reported the following incident alleged to have happened to a Mr. Robert Easley of Defiance, Ohio. Now, Mr. Robert Easley would seem to be a sort of researcher of some repute, holding positions of importance in several UFO, UFO organizations. 
including that of Ohio Director of the Interplanetary News Service, and he was apparently an assistant investigator to the late Professor Maynard. In the small hours of July the 11th, Mr. Easley was awakened by a phone call from a lady who told him that she and seven others were observing two bright, fast-moving UFO. After she hung up, he immediately got dressed and went to the sea. While checking out this report, he noticed that he was being followed by a man in a black sedan with no license plate. The driver, who was a complete stranger to Easley, was dressed in black shoes, black dress trousers, and a dark blue pullover shirt. He missed out on that one. On July the 15th, he was again followed home by the same man in the same car that he was driving his girlfriend home. When he pulled into her driveway, the unknown car sped off. Later that evening, as the two sat talking on the front porch, the car came down the road and stopped right in front of the house as soon as the topic of UFOs entered the conversation. He easily could feel the man staring at them. When they got off the subject, the car left, but when they returned to it an hour later, the same car came back again. It was as if the mysterious driver could hear what they were saying or could read their minds. On July the 17th, Mr. Easley was checking out another rather routine report, and the man reappeared and followed him to and from the scene of the sighting, dressed in apparently the same clothes as before. Between the 11th and the 17th of July, Easley received a total of 12 strange phone calls. In each case, the only sound on the other end of the line was a strange beeping noise. Each call lasted for about 15 seconds, followed by complete silence. The beat sounded far away and as if coming from a machine, possibly a tape recorder. No explanation could be offered by the telephone operator. Easley tends to connect these unusual events with plans he, that he had during that period to check out a possible flying saucer landing site in southern Ohio. After the area was finally checked in early August and found to have no importance after all, the succession of persecutions ceased. Even though it sounds something like a plot from the TV series The Invaders, Easley believes that the aliens, whoever they are, apparently knew about his plans to explore the site and rested easy after nothing was found there. Mr. Easley now echoes the warning given out many years ago by Albert K. Bender, one of the first alleged to be silenced by the notorious Three Men in Black. Bender said, as many will remember, that extreme caution should be exercised by all UFO investigators. Now, there are many more examples, I should say alleged examples, of men in black activity in this and in other editions of Source and News. And I would stress that all I am doing is presenting them to you, not vouching for their truth. Now, however, before I turn from the American scene, an article written by John Keel again in 1967 it's worth quoting from as it is written from the silencing viewpoint, if I may call it that. Personally, I do not entirely agree with him, particularly so far as my own experience in this country goes. But more of that later. This is what Thiel had to say, and I will quote it. It is, as I know, already been printed in one of the issues of the before a journal elsewhere, but I think it's quite worthwhile to read care. Thiel wrote, Already, thousands of people in the United States know the full secret, believe it or not, and thousands more will have the answer before this year ends. I believe the year was 19... a couple of years ago, 1967. These people comprise a select group which we now call silent contactees, and have been playing a small but important role in the numerous blacks of the past three years. In my travels throughout the country in the last year, I have uncovered and interviewed dozens of these silent contactees. They all have the same story to tell, and more important, most of them have been given identical artifacts as proof of their experience. The silent contactees differ from the over-publicized contactees of the past in several important ways. First of all, they are afraid to speak up and reveal what they know. They find themselves in the midst of a complex conspiracy which poses personal threats to them, 
and they have involuntarily enlisted to participate in a series of experiments and adventures which go far beyond anything ever, dre ever dreamed up by science fiction writers. Extensive contacts have actually been going on since 1939, but many have been handled in such a manner that the contactee did not actually realize what was happening to him and frequently rejected the whole situation as some kind of hoax, or, in some cases, as an hallucination or a ghost experience. In many cases, once the contactee's role in the phenomenon was finished, they were somehow brainwashed and conscious memory of their experiences was wiped away. I've learned of other cases in which the silent contactees either went insane or committed suicide. A number of very well-known UFO researchers have been silent contactees for years and have cautiously sprinkled genuine clues in their books and articles but have never dared to reveal the whole story. Other prominent ufologists have been contacted briefly and given specific information to be deliberately passed on to their readers. Ironically, real truth is so bizarre, sensible researchers usually reject it outright until they themselves had first-hand experience. Many of them find it impossible to cope with emotionally until they quietly abandon UFO research in the interest of self-preservation. Nearly all the speculations and conclusions of the last two decades are totally false. The celebrated scientific method cannot, in fact, be successfully applied to this situation. Astronomers and scientists are the people least equipped to understand the phenomenon thanks to their rigid disciplines and preconceived notions of the universe. Metaphysicians, on the other hand, are too gullible and too quick to apply any pseudo-scientific explanation. There is no simple answer to the mystery. All of the current theories, ranging from extraterrestrial to fourth dimensional, cannot actually be applied. Once a researcher has learned to revise his approach to the subject, and discover the keys to look for in the new cases, he can uncover the secret in a matter of weeks. Many have all already done so, and they are keeping their mouths shut. The secret has been under our noses all along. Even before this article is printed, thousands more, thousands more will learn the real truth behind the flying saucer. Like the others, they will all keep quiet. Not even their neighbors will know. The UFO truth is something like psychiatry. The psychiatrist cannot tell you what is wrong, he can only guide you to learning the truth about yourself. So it is with you, folks. It takes personal experience to convince you of the truth. You have been told the truth many times in books and publications, but you have rejected it. This elusive truth cannot be summed up in a few words or a few pages so that it will seem more credible. Some contactees have tried. Unfortunately, very few people are strong enough or emotionally stable enough to cope with the whole secret. And the average UFO researcher does not fully realize the great personal risks involved until they have enmeshed themselves in the situation and then it is too late. That's the end of the quote from John Keel. Well now, I think from the fact that I formed Cosmos in order to uncover contact cases, and to investigate and put into practice all possible methods of, poss of possible communication with spacemen or space entities, says for itself that I don't entirely go along with this. You see, from what Keel, uh, John Keel writes, it follows to me that he therefore ought to know the whole secret himself and therefore be one of these presumed increasing few. But surely, if, as he says, we've been told the truth many times, our minds, or most of our minds at any rate, ought by now to be capable of accepting it without going round the bend, because according to Mr. Keel, we must have frequently read it. Now, I don't pretend to know all the answers, my, all answers myself. That's what I want to find out. But surely the answers must be along some or some combination of these possibilities. Sources could be visitants from interplanetary, interstellar, or intergalactic space whose occupants may be either friendly, hostile, or intent on exploitation or colonization. They may or may not have connections with the spiritualistic, occult, or religious fields also. Craft may be interdimensional, with beings from other planes of existence, possibly even coexistence with ourselves. 
they include some of them based in the land of the earth, or for that matter, based on the earth, the occupants being earth places we're unaware of, or from other planets or systems with bases here. They could be time traveling from earth or elsewhere. They might own us, own this planet, and for all we know, such ownership could be changing hands at this moment. It is possible we may be being invaded by some type or types of entity that can change their forms at will, to suit whatever occasion it might be that requires suiting. Or again, Earth may be about to explode, or be engulfed in the sun turning over, and they're here to take off some of the population now being chosen, or as some believe, to herald the, the dawn of a new age on Earth. They may be partly or entirely connected with what we might loosely term the occult, and not physical entities at all. Now there are many more possibilities I could quote. I'll finish the list with one that some people have come up with, and that is that they come from the devil. Now, I'm perfectly capable, as I'm sure are many others, of accepting any of the foregoing possibilities, and plenty more without going round the bed particularly since, according to John Keel, we've already repeatedly been told the answer, therefore it should lie somewhere amongst those I've already mentioned. Now, they come from the devil. These words, you know, remind me of a complete fallacy in our Bender's book about the three men. One of them told him quite categorically, there is no life after death. Well, they're alleged to have told him that. Now, just think about that for a moment. Because if there is a life after death, it must always be a possibility, as indeed many people believe, that those who have died will find a means to tell us so. Now, the only way we could possibly know that there was no life after death would be for someone who had died to tell us. Should there be, <laughs> should there be no afterlife, this they obviously couldn't do. It's a paradox. Certainly, one may choose to believe or not in an afterlife as one pleases. But a categorical statement that there is no afterlife is, an, is impossible to substantiate, and so whatever one's belief, then it's always remain a possibility. Well, having got slightly adrift from men in black, let me pause here and turn to cases in Great Britain. Now, on December the 5th of last year, last year, sorry, the year before last now, the BBC program today included a three-minute interview with a Mr. Brian Leasley Andrew, who'd opened the UFO Information Centre in Coventry, and he decided to close it down following some rather unusual happenings. And rumour immediately had it that this was a man in black case. This was in fact referred to in an earlier edition of the Cosmos Journal. However, I wrote to Mr. Andrew and asked him if this was actually so. This was his reply, and I quote, he said, my original intention was to collect information from the public who had seen or had experience with UFOs or similar objects. The results were remarkable. I had about 12 genuine reports phoned or sent by letters to me from local people. I also had some non-genuine -gen idiots phone me in the shape of Batman and someone who called himself a Martian. But these are no consequences. <laughs> the phone call I was concerned about was on the th second or third day of the centre being opened. It was a man who phoned, and he spoke in perfect English, in fact, too perfect. He used no slang or everyday expression. He asked, almost insisted, that I told him all the information collected by me during the time that the centre had been opened. He also asked if a woman had been in touch with me to tell of aliens she had seen, she had seen working on a UFO or spacecraft in Coventry. He would not let me question him on this, but I can only presume he meant a craft which had landed and, be, and was being repaired. He goes on, another impression I formed whilst talking to this man was that he had seen this woman watching him working on the craft and wanted to know if the fact had come to the attention of myself or any other authority. Caller's last words were, I will contact you in two days. Please don't publish anything I have told you. He didn't contact me again. And Lisa Leandro goes on, an incident occurred with lights of varying intensity on about the third or fourth week of the centre being open. I was in the house of someone who had seen UFOs on at least three occasions. We had press cuttings out and were discussing scout craft and motherships, and the possibility of the latest object he'd seen being part of what someone else had seen and photographed. 
The main source of electricity is 240 volts and is fairly constant to about 5 and no more than 10 volts up or down. The dimming has occurred within the order of 40 volts up or down. This occurred for the second half of the one and a half hours I was in the house. The third incident occurred when I was repairing my car at the rear of my mother's home. I was in fact underneath the car which was raised off the ground by two rents. I was in the open and able to see the garage next to that of my father. And as I was getting out, I saw a man with an orange face. The face was glowing and perhaps more red than orange and the head about one third larger than normal. It had eyes, nose and mouth, but I cannot tell whether any, whether any ears were attached to it. Nothing was said to me, neither did I say anything to the face, which as I watched it began to melt. The orange red appearance left it and it became smaller and changed to that of an old man. The conversion from the red thing to normal taking about half a minute. Well, in answer to various questions I put to him, it was established that only the one phone call lasting three to five minutes was received by Mr. Andrew, who stated that the caller asked him if anyone from Cosmos contact UK or Bufora had been in touch with him. Now, I strongly suspect here, if he'd been writing to Bufora or Contact UK, the order of those three would be reversed, but uh, never mind. The call was made to his home, and the caller did not, as I had I at first thought, request Mr. Andrew to abandon his usual activity. In answer to a question about possible electrical faults when the dimming incident occurred, his reply was, this is possible, but for lights on a normally stable circuit to vary about 40 volts up and down, five or six times is a bit much. So nothing is there that one could really call pressure from men in black, despite the fact that it was alleged to be so in the first instance. Now, we now come to another rumoured MIB case in another part of England, which was referred to not all that while back in a British, in a British UFO journal. Now, I haven't obtained the permission of the person concerned to talk about this case, but I think you'll agree it really is worth mentioning, so I'll be very highly original and call him Mr. X. It was alleged that Mr. X had abandoned his saucer activities after men in black activity, and rumour also had it that he'd been scared into doing so by a man who'd transfigured himself in the presence of Mr. X and his wife, some sources suggesting that the man himself was an alien. However, I went to see Mr. X myself and found that he had not abandoned his UFO activities at all. Although, in a twisted sort of way, there was a basis of truth in the MIB suggestion. Although his actual appear, experience would appear on the surface to bear very little relation to UFOs, I think you'll find it well worth repeating. So here it is. Now, the man who apparently was capable of transfiguring himself I shall call Bill. It does happen to be his name, actually. He's in his sixties, his regular church goer, and was actively interested in UFOs as well as psychic matters. Now, this man had formed a local UFO group, and here's the MIB connection, had to disband it after uh, one, two or three, I think it was, visits from men in black type who had threatened him, once when he was actually in church although it's not exactly clear what he was, in fact, threatened with. However, our Mr. X came to hear a bill through Fred, and he and his wife called on him several times. On the last occasion, which was in September 1968, Mr. X asked Bill about his reputed ability to transfigure himself, and Bill told him, yes, it did happen, but he couldn't control it. It sometimes happened when his mind was tired, and suddenly he appeared to the people as a different person, he himself being very, fairly short and thin. Well, on this last occasion, Mr. X and his wife had stayed until about one or two in the morning before they departed. And as they were going down the path, Mr. X found that all his movements were slowing up, and it was as much as he could do to move. He looked back, and the figure at the door was that of a man who looked completely different and had an utterly different build, very portly, not thin at all. Mrs. X became very frightened and told her husband to hurry to the car which was parked a few doors up from the house, 
they were in such a position that they would have to drive past the house again before they reached the main road. Well, Miss Greg just about made it to the car, although his movements were getting slower and slower all the time. He just couldn't do anything about it. And inside the car it was icy cold, although it was a pretty warm night for the time of year. He got the car going, still in slow motion, and as they gradually passed the gate, he saw the figure walking down the path to the gate. And as he, or it, walked, they could see it was surrounded by a blue aura. Anyway, as the car gradually moved out of the area, normal movement came back to Mr. X, so he still felt cold and mentally and physically unwell. This feeling suddenly left after about an hour. The following day they told friends about the occurrence, and a few days later they had a phone call from Bill, who said he'd been told he'd had a transformation when they left, but he'd been unaware of it at the time. And he said he'd like to come over and see them, which, after some demur, they finally agreed to his doing. When he came, he told them that all he remembered was walking down the path to wave them goodbye. He was absolutely himself unaware of any transformation. The only tentative explanation of his transfigurations he could give was that he believed that in a former existence he'd been a monk, and that when his mind reached a certain degree of emptiness or tiredness, his former personality took him over. He added, too, that at times he visited a certain spot in the ground of Yorkshire Abbey, I've been there myself actually, where he feels a very special sense of relief and elation, although at another spot, about a quarter of a mile away, he felt exactly the opposite. Well, altogether quite an unusual story, I'm sure you'll agree, and I think one well worth repeating. Well now, some of you will know, I'm sure, that I had a great deal to do with the investigations into the Scoriton mystery, in which the late Ernest Arthur Bryant was the central figure as the alleged contactee. Well, I'm not going into the pros and cons of that case now, except on two points. Firstly, some months ago, to my astonishment, I found a reference in one of the American magazines to Bryant having been visited by men in black. Well, I'm not saying he wasn't, but I will say, and without fear of contradiction, that I've spent more time on Bryant's claims than anyone else. I visited on him on numerous occasions, by dozens of letters from him, and altogether about 10 or 12 hours in tape recording. And absolutely nowhere is there any indication whatsoever that he suffered any form of attention from men in black. I would very much like to know where that magazine obtained his information. Trouble is, I read it in passing, didn't mark it at the time. As he had something like 30 different American exchange magazines, I hadn't been able to locate it again. The second point I would like to make about Scorison is this. I regard it as an inherently possible story. It could have happened. Unfortunately, I now regard it as extremely unlikely to have actually done so. The reason I refer to it again now is that while I don't regard them as classical men in black types, I now believe there were in fact three involved in cooking up the story that Brian executed. I shan't say any more on this here now since this is the men in black talk, not the hoaxes on March the 21st, where in the other cases, amongst other cases, I shall be expounding more on the development of bonds in the Scottish and affair. Now, to make a personal point, I can only speak here for two UFO organizations, but to my knowledge, no one in any executive position in these organizations has ever been threatened in any way because they've been delving too deeply into the UFO enigma. On the other hand, I often wonder, you know, should I at any time decide that UFOs were taking up too much of my time and I dropped active interest in the subject, there were a whole crop of rumours would start up about my having been silent. I rather think they would, you know. As far as actually being approached is concerned, I can only read, uh, repeat rather, what I wrote in Cosmos Journal number two, which was, should communications of any type be received from men in black, Cosmos guarantees that such communications will be publicized in future e editions of the journal, whether or not they are of a threatening nature, and no matter what form they take, subject only to the Northern obscenity. I should just add to that, though, that as I also wrote, would-be hopes need not bother, 
Should they do so, they will be exposed to the pages of this journal when found out, but please note the word is when and not if. In other words, what I'm saying is, as far as this country is concerned, and I stress this country, that I've come across very little basis or evidence of any black activity, certainly not at, so to speak, executive level. I'm not saying there is none, only, that only just in the one case I referred to earlier have I found any indication that there might be. Now, before I switch back to a final look at the magazine, I'm sure you'll forgive me for referring once again, as I did last week, to the most unfortunate recent death of Dr. Lindner, the well-known Australian ufologist who at the time of his death was on a world tour on behalf of his employer, and was at the same time grasping the opportunity to visit various UFO personalities and societies in the various countries he passed through. Lionel Beer invited me to meet him when he visited when Dr. Lindley visited London for a couple of days last summer, and I was therefore extremely upset to hear that only about ten days later he'd been killed at a tra by a train at Frankfurt Station in Germany, the day following going to see Carl Wieter Wiesbaden, who publishes the German UFO, the German paper Ufo Nachrichten. Now, less than a week after his death, I heard it implied from several different people that this was a man in black coat, he'd been pushed, and so on. Well, what in fact actually happened, as you can read in Space Link, is that as he was getting his last pieces of luggage, luggage on the train, it was flagged away, and he fell under the train as it started to move, being dragged along by it as it left the station. It was a very sad and unfortunate accident, but it had nothing to do with men in black, and it's worthwhile bearing in mind how quickly, in some people's minds, it became so connected. To return again for a moment to the source of news, the idea was put forward in a recent issue that the UFO personalities were being duplicated, or at least impersonated, by men in black types on a number of occasions. Various noted researchers had apparently been, spoken, been seen and spoken to in different places of the same time. This line of thought, you know, is an intriguing one, whether or not one believes the report. As one of the things John Keel has alleged is that some contactees and witnesses of saucer landings have been threatened with substitution should they not remain silent. Mind you, if we take this line of thought too seriously, it does become, paradoxically, a sort of car cartoonist dream of the how are you, I think I know who you are, who am I variety, and also rather science fictionist. But, Oddly enough, I do know of a case in this country where substitution has been alleged, although not in an MIB context, this particular case supposedly being with the consent of the person concerned. Before I finally leave our old friend Saucer News, incidentally, you may be interested to know that allegedly photos were taken of men in black, and they appear in a copy of Saucer News, that I have here. For what it's worth, that is a photograph. There's also a photograph of a car <coughs> on the front page of it. Well, obviously they could have been quite deliberately posed, although I would hesitate to say definitely that they were true or false. But it is, I think, worthwhile pointing out that the pictures of the car do not go down as far as the number plate. One thing quite a few people, particularly those who are interested in flying saucers, seem to suffer from are odd phone calls. I referred to Mr. Easley and his alleged boots earlier on. One can also find that there's no one at the other end of the line, and find one's conversation interrupted by peculiar noises and so on. So far, this hasn't troubled me over much. Please, no hope scores, I wish I hadn't said that. <laughs> Actually, and this has nothing to do with flying saucers, or leaking it if it has, it's working in a pretty roundabout manner. But actually, nearly all the wrong numbers who bring us up, and there have been plenty of them at all hours, they want the nearest doctor. Which puzzled us quite a bit until I found out that our doctor's health service registration number, which was all on all his patients' medical cards, just happened to be the same as our phone number, which explained quite a lot. These apart, the only odd call I can really remember personally was one evening when I answered the phone, and all I seemed I could hear at the other end was the usual heavy breathing. So, uh, after I repeated our number, 
who said hello a few times, I decided I'd do something a bit more drastic. So I took a deep breath, <laughs> put my mouth close to the mouthpiece, with the top of the voice, shouted, Hey! <laughs> I then put the phone down with considerable satisfaction. <laughs> a few minutes later, however, the phone rang again. <laughs> and I had to put Kate and her eight brother-in-law was complaining I nearly busted his ears off. <laughs> so I'm not really sure whether to recommend this method or not. <laughs> however, again to get back to men in black, it's obviously really up to the individual to make up his or her own mind on the evidence available as to whether they do exist. <laughs> For my part, and if you think incidentally that I seem to t treat things a little lightly, this is because I believe that a sense of humour is very necessary in this interest of ours. Without it, one can start to take oneself far too seriously and lose one's perspective. This, however, is something totally different from taking the subject seriously, which I hope I do. For my part, therefore, and I would stress that this is only my opinion, it seems to me that whilst there could be a lot of wildly exaggerated and made-up stories concerning the MIB activities, at bottom I think there are some grounds at any rate to indicate that some of these gentry do exist. Now if, and again I say if, one accepts one accept their existence, the question obviously becomes, who are they? And again, if one assumes their purpose is to dissuade further thought or research, why are they doing so? There is a possibility they're agents of various governments. They could be Earthmen, controlled by alien beings. They could be aliens themselves. They could be agents of this world's vested interest, our old friends and known from Zurich, if you like. They could be genuine investigators, whose actions have been misinterpreted by some of the people on whom they've called. They could be employed even by sources of societies and journals to whip up interest when it might seem to be flagging another sort of vested interest, so to speak. As I said earlier, everyone likes a mystery. So I'm sure you'll agree that so far as societies in this country are concerned, there's not one society in Britain that could afford to employ full-time staff, let alone half a dozen men in black. Well, what would be their object? Well, we have the old chestnut, so far as the idea of their being government agents is concerned, but source of information is being suppressed because it could cause panic and mass hysteria. Yet if so, this method would seem more likely to create panic than to stop it. It might be that aliens are deliberately trying either to suppress information getting out about themselves or just to confuse them. It could be, as many people think, that we are the centre of a conflict between good and evil forces, the men in black obviously representing the evil or satanic forces. It's possible, if the answer is that they're agents of vested interest, that they're being used to combat the likelihood to any, of any great degree of contact between ourselves and benevolently inclined space people which might lead to a complete social, technological and, if you like, moral revolution, and that this would completely shatter their position of power. As I say, it's a valid point of view. Well, I'm sure there must be plenty of more possibilities that I haven't mentioned. I'm sure you can doubtless think of quite a few more yourself. But I'm going to wind up the moment by leaving you with two further thoughts. The first one being that all this countries, and I'm sure all other countries too, all this countries, sort of societies, suffer because of the various shades of opinion that there are sort of wise, which it is often very difficult and it's not impossible to reconcile. Anyway, one question I'll leave you to think about is the rather enigmatic one. Could it be that in fact some of the men in black are men in white. The second thought goes back to the adjective black again. Now it's surprising you know how frequently witches, witchcraft and black magic crop up in connection with UFO investigations. I know of three or four such cases over the last few months. So could our men in black have any connection with witchcraft? Well I think I've covered a fair amount of ground, possibly too much. 
So I'll just finish with a request. Should any of you be approached at any time by any of these gentry and feel they are the genuine article, so to speak, please don't keep it yourselves. Tell me about it as well. Thank you.